Richard Eidlin here with Business for America. Thanks for participating in our call this afternoon on the impact of the midterm election on Pennsylvania's business climate. And what we wanted to do was hear from some experts uh, this afternoon on the very consequential results of the 2020 midterms last Tuesday. And you know we know that the ballots are still being counted in a few districts. And um, that's exciting. So maybe we'll get some uh, insights here into how those uncalled races will turn out. Um, but before um, we get going into the content, I wanted to thank our co-hosts who made this uh, program possible, the American Sustainable Business Network, Fair Districts PA, Pitt Cyber, which is part of the University of Pittsburgh, the Committee of 70 out of Philadelphia, the League of Women Voters in Pennsylvania and the Pocono Chamber of Commerce. So thanks to all those groups and, and also to the West Philadelphia Corridor Collaborative. And um, let me tell you all just a little bit about the work that Business for America is doing in partnership with the West Philly Corridor Collaborative. And over the past several years, Business for America, which is a national nonpartisan not-for-profit, has been engaging <clears throat> and educating companies to make the business case that a well-functioning um, government and a healthy democracy is good for the business climate and good for our economy in Pennsylvania. So with funding from the William Penn Foundation and the Heinz Endowments, we have been uh, working over the past several years to support a number of voting rights related issues to improve election security, uh, election integrity, and look at other ways in which the state legislature can uh, enable wide scale participation of voters throughout the state. One of the initiatives we undertook last year uh, in the midst of the pandemic was encouraging the legislature to focus on um, ensuring voting rights maintained were maintained rather than continuing to investigate the 2020 election. And part of our critique has been that um, business does best and succeeds best when the state legislature is working in a bipartisan fashion, um, which can certainly be a challenge, but there are some signs I think in this most recent election <clears throat> that suggest um, an opportunity to do that. So without further ado, let me start um, with our panel this morning. And um, we are really happy to have uh, Dan Pearson with us from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Dan is a uh, columnist there and an op-ed writer and a political reporter uh, among his uh, areas of focus are the election. So Dan has lots of uh, things to say, having worked on this issue for a, a number of years. Um, so Dan, let me start with you and, and thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, so Dan, as you, you know, as you take a look at the results of the election, turnout was pretty high, independence played a role, and it seems as though maybe the, um, the results were more um, mod moderate than we had expected. So what are, you know, what's a, a major takeaway you have from the results of last week's election? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we saw pretty clearly that candidates who were obsessed with relitigating the 2020 election did very poorly uh, across the country. Um, they under performed relative to expectations uh, for Republicans in their races. In Georgia, for example, uh, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, uh, who took a lot of heat directly from Trump uh, for not, you know, for, for certifying the correct results in Georgia, he won handily. Um, and so did Brian, Governor Brian Kemp, who supported Brad Raffensperger in that. Meanwhile, Herschel Walker, who spent a lot of time questioning the election results, is going to a runoff in second place. In Pennsylvania, we saw Doug Mastriano kind of fall on his face and really not find much support anywhere across the Commonwealth. 
even in some traditionally Republican areas. Um, so I think that for, uh, and, and also, you know, this wasn't an electorate that was, uh, you know, heavily, uh, you know, it, there was higher turnout, but it was in Philadelphia, we had, you know, pretty average turnout. So it wasn't an election where Democrats necessarily won by mobilizing their own voters. It was an election that Democrats won primarily because Republicans and independents voted for them in higher levels than, than normal. Hmm. And and what would you say, Dan, is the public's confidence in the election system now? Do you think after a number of you know accusations made in 2020 that there was widespread fraud and an effort on the part of some candidates to really undermine uh, you know, the integrity of the system, have things changed? Do voters feel more confident now as a result of, you know, what happened last Tuesday? I, I think most voters ha are confident in our election process and our elected, our election officials. I think most voters recognize that our election officials are, you know, hardworking neighbors of theirs who are trying to do the right thing. And I think they resoundingly rejected those who felt differently. Um, personally, I, I think that, you know, I am less scared for the future of our democracy today than I was two weeks ago, because a lot of these candidates who did deny the 2020 election, we're seeing them accept the results this time around. Uh, Doug Mastriano even has conceded. It helps that he lost by 15 points, um, and it wasn't very close, but th these are positive signs, and I hope that Kerry Lake also concedes in the near future as well. In, in Arizona, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, um, what role did independent voters play, do you think, in the Pennsylvania election? Uh, you know, we, we're going to hear from Carol in a moment about redistricting, but did that have a marked impact, do you think, on the outcome yeah. and also on how voters chose to support one candidate or, or another? Yeah, I mean, if you compare, <clears throat> for example, uh, in, the, in the Philadelphia suburbs, uh, how somebody like Pat Toomey did back in 2016 with how Dr. Oz and Doug Mastriano did this year, you'll see a significant decline of votes, uh, nearly 300,000 fewer people just in those four counties uh, supported, uh, supported Oz and Mastriano this year. And that is in large scale due to independent voters. Independent voters prioritized uh, picking candidates who they felt were center of the road and appealing to, you know, basic everyday table concerns as opposed to campaigns that were focused on what they considered to be non-issues. Mm. And what do you think the major driving issues were this time? What compelled people to go out and vote? You know, were they uh, concerned particularly about uh, economic recovery from COVID, from inflation, uh, wanting to you know, support a healthy democracy? What do you think the drivers were? Yeah, I mean, in, in Pennsylvania, the exit polls showed that people were concerned about democracy. Uh, they wanted to make sure that they were supporting candidates who supported democracy. Uh, they were concerned about abortion rights in the state as well. Um, you know, that's not necessarily a, a business issue, but it was a, a big motivator for a lot of independent voters in the state. And also they were concerned about, you know, candidates who had substantive plans to deal with inflation and other economic problems. And yeah. that's those are the, the three you know motivating factors that we, we see you know for voters across this the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Dan, given that um, there are several seats in the House that are still undecided, but the Republicans control the state Senate, mm -hmm. um, it seems as though, there might be more opportunity uh, for in, in the House in particular for some more collaboration and bipartisanship. Are you optimistic about that? Or do you think that the winning majority will, you know, uh, as it has typically done in the past, just seek to exclude participation from the minority party? It's it's so close in the House that there's not going to be much of uh of an opportunity to get anything done without collaboration, uh, particularly with a, a Democratic governor who has a strong man mandate and a Republican Senate as well. So the House is kind of in the middle of these two bodies. And if they try to do things narrowly along party lines, both of these parties are big coalitions and they don't even agree with each other on everything to begin with. So things are gonna have to be done in a collaborative fashion. And we know that Pennsylvania is capable of working collaboratively and bipartisanly. Uh, we see that 
often at budget season. We saw we've we've seen uh, that with the recent rescue plan for uh, for public transit in the state um, that was passed last year. We know that they they are capable of of doing that. Uh, and I think that the more that they see that this is what voters want too, the more that they'll they'll be inclined to work in a bipartisan fashion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. What are some of the issues that you'll be tracking regarding the business community and, um, you know, the state of the economy that, you know, will directly affect uh, infrastructure investment or workforce development, you know, that the legislature will have to make some decisions about? Yeah, I mean, as, as Governor Wolf has said, he's leaving, uh, you know, Governor-elect Shapiro with very full coffers. The state has a very good financial position. Uh, whether we see a recession or not, or we're just dealing with more inflation, uh, there's there's actually a lot of money between higher tax revenues and money from the American Rescue Plan that the governor can use to really put his stamp uh, on the state going forward. So how that money is used, uh, whether or not we can make uh, not just infrastructure investments, but the right infrastructure investments as well. It's not enough to just spend the money. The money needs to be spent effectively and efficiently. Often we've had uh, a situation in this state where uh, folks are um, you know, building new roads while the old ones are still in a state of disrepair. Uh, Ed Rendell mm -hmm. talked a lot about that as governor. Um, and then the, the highway construction companies come back and say, hey, we need more money to fix the roads. Uh, right. So... Uh, so it's uh, it's making smart decisions with this money is gonna is gonna be really important uh, going forward, and I, I really hope that Governor Elect Shapiro and the legislature make fight for those uh, right decisions because it, it's sometimes hard to make the right decision. It, it looks easy from where I sit, from where they sit, they they have much different pressures than I do, and it's it's right. very it's very hard. Uh, so I, I'm hopeful that they'll take on those fights and do the right things. Good. Dan, let me ask you one final question. I remember when we were chatting last week, you mentioned that when you were in the city commissioner's office uh, and you would try to get uh, media outlets, you know, including your current paper, to, yes. fo to follow the uh, process by which the election was conducted, you didn't, you didn't get a lot of pickup. And I wonder, um, you suggested that that has changed. But what thought do you have about how educated the voting public is about how the election system works? And if you have any recommendations, particularly about what businesses can do to increase the knowledge of here's how government works, here's how we run our elections in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I, I think people know how the election system works better now than they ever did before. Uh, there's, there's just significantly more attention. Uh, and there will be going forward. I, I, I think until you really see this uh, stop the steal rhetoric completely fade, uh, there will still be increased attention as, as there should be on our elections. As far as what uh, the business community can do to increase awareness, um, you know, I think partnering with organizations like the League of Women Voters and Com Community 70 to do, to do workshops to, to make sure that the business community and business leaders themselves have you know access to uh, you know seminars, panel discussions like this, uh, where they can learn more about elections, um, and also you know in Pennsylvania, it's it's possible that your business itself could be a polling place. You know, it's mm -hmm. I, I voted in barber shops and and all sorts of places in, in Philadelphia. Um, it's you know you can you can take as active as a role in local elections as as you really want to. Um, right. you know, as you know, you're, you're a private citizen and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the great things about running your own business is you get to make your own decisions. Right. Good. Dan, thank you. And, you know, just to pick up on that point for a moment, <clears throat> um, in 2020 business for America, uh, organized, um, a number of initiatives in Pennsylvania, you know, one, uh, in which we, uh, secure private, uh, companies to donate, uh, product, uh, hand sanitizer, gloves, uh, bottled water, and those were um, distributed to various county officials and to the state election secretary of, uh, of the Commonwealth, who then redistributed those. So the business community uh, can certainly play a key role in educating you know, its workforce 
about how the election works and how about um, government uh, functions. So good, Dan, we'll get back to you here uh, with a question here in, in a few moments, but thank you. And uh, folks, anyone who has a question who you know you want answered, just put it in the uh, in the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll we'll try to get to that. So let's go to um, uh, <clears throat> uh, to Carol Cunningham, and uh, Carol is the chair of Fair Districts PA. And uh, Carol, are you with us there? I am. I'm right here. Okay, great. Thank you. Good. So, Carol, I know your organization, Fair Districts PA, has been doing very important work on trying to restructure the map of Pennsylvania, ensuring that the districts are competitive. And it seems as though your work paid off this time uh, in a significant way. So, first of all, thank you for, for doing that. And um, secondly, tell us a little bit about how the new districting formula might have impacted um, those who were elected by the by uh, the voters. Sure, and I'll say so. We were not um, the the redistricting had to happen. Sometimes people say, "Well, don't redistrict." The redistricting has to happen. Um, every 10 years after the census for all of our legislative districts to keep them fairly even. So that had to happen. Um, our argument was that it should not be done by the people who are elected in those districts, that no other major democracy allows legislators to draw their own district lines to decide who's going to vote for them. Voters should be choosing um, their elected officials rather than elected officials deciding who their voters will be. So we have pushed for seven years now for an independent redistricting commission. Some of our partners, including Committee of 70, um, draw, the, um, draw the Lines, League of Women Voters, Common Cause, have been, some of those groups have been advocating for decades for an independent citizens redistricting commission. That didn't happen. And yet we believe there was enough public attention on this that the chair for the legislative reapportionment committee was a very fair, um, a very fair moderator and uh, an advocate for the voters of Pennsylvania for the state house and Senate districts. And there was um, involvement by the courts for the congressional districts. And in all of that, we think the maps that were produced are much more fair. We can't say they're more competitive because in Pennsylvania, there are places where you can't draw a competitive district without having the district you know, go wandering all over the place because we have some very re red areas and some very blue areas. But the map itself overall, we believe is much more reflective of the voter population that the districts were drawn to reflect communities um, and to, to more closely match the vote share um, that we see. And we think that happened, which is why we have a we're sitting trying to figure out, you know, who who is going to have the majority in the House. Um, that's as it should be in a state that is a very swing, uh, the, the premier swing state in the country. I heard somebody say on the radio this morning, um, we should not know before the election who is going to control both chambers. And for, for most of 30 years, we've had one party, 24 of the last 30 years, Republican Party has controlled both chambers. And that's been because of maps. And and that hurts the legislative process. It also dampens public engagement because people feel like, why do, why do I bother? And it's also, I believe, harmed harmed the economy of the state because we have legislators who, who don't have to work hard to, to meet the needs of the state. Rather, they can just protect their own, their own turf and, and not get a great deal done. So we think the maps are much better. We think that will help Pennsylvania democracy and also help Pennsylvania's economy. So as you take a look at the results and, you know, the close uh, division, particularly within the House, do you have um, some prognosis about how this may change the behavior and incentive structure of legislators? Are they going to be more inclined to look for bipartisan opportunities to solve some problems, do you think? Well, some some will never be bipartisan. We know that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we do have some extremes um, in our state legislature. Um, but there will certainly be people kind of looking at the, the balance of power and thinking about how to get things done. And we know that there are really good people in both parties, in both chambers, who would really love to get some things done. And this might be the occasion that they can get some things done. We, we started a campaign called Fix Harrisburg last spring to focus on legislative rules. Pennsylvania has some of the worst legislative rules in the country in terms of allowing 
um, one party to control the agenda completely. We're hoping that um, in both chambers, they'll take a look at those rules, rethink them a little bit, and, um, and look for ways to make sure that bipartisan solutions actually get a vote. There are some really important, really long-term problems that Pennsylvania has been facing. Um, there are good solutions introduced in every session. They sit in committee because one committee chair can say, we're not going to look at that. I'm not interested in that. Um, and, and we know that there's a problem of money in our state legislature. There's not much that blocks campaign finance um, contributions, not much that blocks lobbyists investment um, in impacting outcomes. Um, so we would love to see the rules change a bit so that the really good solutions that Pennsylvania needs would get a vote. And we're hopeful that this, this new climate might make that possible. Right. Good. And Carol, as we've talked about, you know, Business for, Amer um, Business for America you know, is looking to build a statewide coalition of companies to advocate for some of those changes, um, you know, in the spring. So can you give us a little guidance on what specific rules changes you might like to see? And if those rules were changed, what would the impact be on, on businesses across the state, do you think? And I know that's sort of a general question because there are small, mid and large yeah. size companies, but, um, you know, what, what insight could you offer us? Sure. Well, we're asking, um, Fixed Harrisburg Campaign is asking for rules that allow bipartisan solutions to get a vote. So if there's a, a bill that has co-sponsors from both parties, um, there's no reason that that bill doesn't get a hearing and doesn't get a vote. What we're seeing right now is that the, um, the, the majority party committee chairs are blocking bills introduced by the other party. We have an all-time low. Only two bills introduced by House Democrats, two bills introduced by Senate Democrats were passed in this session. That's an all-time low. And we know that good ideas can come from both sides. Um, and and the, best, the best solutions are collaborative. Um, and so we would love to see rules that, that in, ensure that bills that have support from both sides can move forward. And what we're seeing too is about half the bills that come out of the House are ignored by the Senate, and about half that come out of the Senate are ignored by the by the House. It's a huge waste of effort, a huge waste of money, and and a lot of those bills are, you know, there's there's kind of um, who gets the credit questions, and and our our law should not be decided by who gets the credit. They should be decided by what would this do to benefit the people of Pennsylvania to ensure that we have a strong economy and good jobs. And so some specific issues, for instance, broadband. Uh, we've had 20 years of Center for Rural Pennsylvania, of you know, the PA Farm Bureau, um, county commissioners, um, municipal bureau, um, borough associations asking for better broadband. There was a bill passed in 2004 that blocks all kinds of creative approaches to improving broadband access. And even though we're seeing lots of IRA money flowing into Pennsylvania, um, it's not certain that that's going to be used well simply because of this bill back in 2004 that needs to be fixed. And there are attempts to fix it, and the committee chairs ignore those attempts. Um, so, so that's an example. How do you have a strong economy in Pennsylvania's rural cities if if your folks can't even access internet to to make their companies visible internationally or nationally or even with across the state, so so that's one example. Um, there's there's a number of studies on municipal distress done by the PA Economy League, and there are um, really important changes to fix the PA tax structure. Um, that would help our municipalities. Those never get a hearing. They don't get a vote. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of really important work that needs to be done. Um, we would love to see bipartisan collaboration to make that happen. Great. Um, Carol mentioned the IRA. So that was not your individual retirement account, but that's the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, folks. And um, Carol, let me go back to this idea of um, increasing the functionality of government. So much of what you're saying is that the rules, if changed, would increase um, <clears throat> the possibility of collaboration <clears throat> among the two parties and would disincentivize um, certain factions within both party to really just game the system and seek out, you know, advantage. So, um, you know, when you think about what role the business community can play in helping to encourage a new set of incentives to make the system more functional and to make elected officials understand that you know there are serious economic challenges 
that the state faces. What can business particularly do to help this cause here? I think business can be a strong advocate um, for better rules, for better policy. And to say we, we are aware of the important <clears throat> challenges that Pennsylvania faces and we want good solutions and they need to be data-driven solutions. They need to, mm -hmm. you know, so so for instance, there are committees that have hearings and they they have um, testimony from one side. They don't invite, you know, really well-respected experts. They don't include the data. And there are bills that are pushed through very quickly without allowing stakeholders to, to review and to offer comment. I think mm -hmm. business should say, we that's a bad way to do anything. No business would allow decisions to be made that way. Um, hastily, late at night, without data, without expert testimony. Um, and, and then we pay the price for, for bills that were done hastily. Even our our election reform bill that opened up the door to mail-in ballots was done without full stakeholder access to, to review and to critique. And we're seeing that play out with, with all sorts of challenges. So I think business has, has a really strong voice in advocacy in Harrisburg. And I think it would be great to have businesses um, reach out to their own legislators and say, we want better rules. We want better policy. We want to see collaboration. We're really tired of the, you know, the partisan games and those are hurting the economy and, and withhold contributions <laughs> saying, Ooh. you know, we're going to, we're going to contribute to candidates who are working for bipartisan solutions and who are advocating for better rules and better policy. Okay. Great. Good. So, <clears throat> so everyone, that's an open invitation to, to work with uh, Business for America as we partner with Fair Districts PA on a campaign to make uh, this political system work better. Um, great. And I just want to read one comment here from uh, Bert, uh, Bert DeRazio. And pardon me if I mispronounce that last name, but, you know, Bert comments that, you know, don't hear, you know, in Pennsylvania, <clears throat> Don't we have one of the highest paid state legislatures in the country that is also one of the least effective? Um, and I think it's a full time legislature as well, Carol. Is that is that correct? Yes, yeah, so we do have a full time legislature. There are state legislatures that are part time, um, that are paid very little, that work for three or four months, that that pass far more bills and a much higher percentage of the bills that are introduced. And people will say, oh, well, it's not the number of bills. That's true. And yet we have lots of pressing problems and lots of bills that would address those. And the fact that they get as little done as they do is not something to brag about. We <clears throat> probably per bill, we we haven't done the we we've we've tried to get the numbers, but per bill, I would say Pennsylvania's bills passed are among the probably the most expensive in the world per bill in terms of staffing hours. Um, I, I think they're extremely expensive. And, and especially since we have bills that are introduced year after year after year after year and never go anywhere. It's a huge waste. Um, there's also a comment I'd be here saying, um, we might say that never before in the history of the US government have so few been led by so many. I might say so many been led by so few. We have a few gatekeepers who control everything. And there are legislators who said, I could be a paperweight and get more done than I do here because I have no say in anything, which is the case. And we've had legislators say, I represent 65,000 people and I have zero voice, which means that all of the people I represent have zero voice. Um, that is very much the case right now. We would love to see that change. Okay, good. Well, we will return to that. Um, so let, let's shift um, our focus a, a bit here. Uh, Laura Elizabeth Putnam is with us from the University of Pittsburgh. And um, Laura is a professor of history and also is part of the Pitt um, cyber disinformation team at the university. And Laura, um, trying to find you on my screen here. Okay, good, I, I see you there. So um, Laura, the, <clears throat> the conversation, you know, we wanted to have with you was about the role of information in this ecosystem of information and what people were exposed to um, this time around and um, what impact that may have had in their choices. So I know at, at uh, the university, you've done lots of thinking about how people assimilate information, what they're attracted to, um, and, you know, essentially whether the information also that elected officials or those running for office were using was that accurate and truthful information. 
So give us a sense of sort of what the ecosystem of information um, was in the 2022 election cycle. And uh, are we moving in the right direction with the kinds of information that people were exposed to? Yeah, absolutely. So in order to understand 2022, I think it's helpful to jump back and ask what happened in 2020 in terms of disinformation and exposure to misinformation and false claims. Um, you know, in 2022, as the coronavirus pandemic hit and everyone was often literally spending more time, you know, indoors in front of a screen, less time uh, in their workplace, in physical workplaces um, or, uh, you know, uh, places of worship uh, out purchasing things, out talking to friends, spending time together, we just saw a an onslaught of false claims and a sort of continual ramping up of uh, you, disinformation campaigns within social media spaces in particular. Um, and this first focused on, um, you know, confusing in some cases fully false claims about the pandemic, about public health uh, responses, about origins, um, and, you know, it's it's common if we look across history, when big scary things are happening and we don't know how to explain them, it's common for there to be sort of rumors um, or um, so what, what some color, scholars sometimes call moral panics that sort of create enemies and, ex and, and explain bad things as being the result of intentional actions by a sort of a cabal of bad, of bad people or enemies, rather than just saying like, sometimes there are things we don't understand, or sometimes, you know, microbes do things to our bodies that are really bad, but we're still figuring out the details. You know, human societies are really bad at sitting in that space of we're still figuring it out, and it's just much easier to have enemies to point to, and and to in in some ways it's sort of more reassuring sometimes to think that there's an evil plot out there than to recognize that there is no evil plot, but we're just trying to work things out together. It's just us. We're just all here trying to work things out together. So the spring of 2020 saw a surge of both. Uh, disinformation of, about the coronavirus. We saw the QAnon conspiracy theory, which had really been, you know, dying down and really what had been um, uh, uh, sort of isolated in sort of far right wing uh, social media spaces, really rapidly infiltrate into a, a whole bunch of much more mainstream social media spaces, Facebook groups, and so on. And, you know, what one thing that we are clear on is that it's not just disinformation isn't just about seeing one false claim on a tweet and suddenly believing it. It's about a cycle in which um, people are pushed to distrust what would otherwise be what are actually trustworthy sources of information. So disinformation functions kind of as a as a as a whirlpool or as a cycle in which people are leveraged away from trustworthy sources like the mainstream media, like educational institutions, like public health officials. And they're sort of leveraged away and channeled towards exposure to um, sort of upstart voices who claim to have the real story, right? And so, and we saw that happening sort of over the course of 2020. And then that entire apparatus of those sort of those new voices who had claimed, you know, trust us, don't trust them, don't trust the mainstream media, don't trust the newspapers, don't trust election officials, trust us. There's a plot of foot and, and we're the only ones who are going to tell you about it. And that whole apparatus was then sort of put at the, um, you know, used to ramp up the quote unquote, stop the steal claims, right? These false claims about election fraud. And, and I guess what I'm saying is that that didn't happen overnight. It was the, it was the product of this long process of, of winning, pushing people to distrust otherwise trustworthy sources of information. Um, and, you know, with the results that we saw in 2020 and on January 6th of 2021. So the really good news is that all sorts of, you know, and there wasn't a single responsible actor for that. I mean, the former president was a, a seriously responsible actor, but he was not single-handedly responsible for anything. Their, their social media companies played a role, other elected officials played a role, media influencer, partisan media played a role and so on. So what we've seen since 2020 is, and since 2021, is many different actors involved in, in our society making changes that actually turn out to have helped. Like there's actually, there's really a good story to be told here. Part of that is about social media companies that definitely have done a much better job. Even companies that many of us like love to criticize like Facebook, like Twitter. Um, none of these companies, none of the platforms are perfect in the choices around moderation, but there is nothing like 2022 saw nothing like the vast spread of QAnon conspiracy theories through neighborhood Facebook groups that, that we did see in 2020. 2022 has really been different. 
but also totally critical is the news media, um, which was much more attentive to the beginning, to the need to sort of proactively push out accurate information about voting processes in particular, and then immediately respond to false claims when they arose. And similarly, public institutions, the Secretary of State's office here in Pennsylvania was very attentive in 2022 this year to sort of when new when new false narratives began emerging that were going to cause people to question the validity of the um, of, for instance, mail ballots. Uh, there were there was a rumor that was started, or there was a, an issue raised uh, about three weeks ago over whether there had been. 240,000 or 255,000 quote unquote uncertified voters sent mail ballots. And what this, this was a sort of weaponization of transparency. There, there are multiple structures in place that provide checks and balances to make sure that mail-in balloting is secure in Pennsylvania. And, and public information is put out by, by counties as well as by the Secretary of State's office to make visible what that process is through which these multiple layers of certification happen. And so a, a statistic was taken out of context, misrepresented, and used um, <clears throat> first by some uh, Republican lawmakers in, in Harrisburg and in a, you know, a, 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 a query to the Secretary of State's office that was worded to be as inflammatory as possible. And then that was picked up by national partisan influencers. Mm -hmm. But what did we see? We, that was not, you know, maybe in 2020, Folks would have, journalists would have been like, oh, that's so silly. We're not even going to cover that. You know, it's it's such an, if you know the process, you know, it's an absurd claim. Of course, this certification process has multiple components. There's no need for concern over this. But what we saw this year was rapid response across the board. We saw um, the Secretary of State's office put out a an informative, um, you know, um, on social media, uh, had, had, you um, information ready to go that clarified what the processes were that meant that these were not in fact, you know, ballots being sent out willy nilly to random people whose certification would never be checked. We saw multiple explainers being published by newspapers and so on. So there was just a, like a, uh, not, not in, not explicitly top down coordinated, but a loosely federated, I would say, rapid response model for getting accurate information in and for preventing the creation of what scholars sometimes call data voids, places, you know, if there's no accurate information out there about a topic and someone Googles that topic, they're never going to find nothing, right? You never Google and find no information. You're going to find something. And so if there's no accurate information in the way, what that person is going to find is likely going to be a conspiracy theory, a fringe site, some um, false claim someone has hyped in, an, in a, a similar situation elsewhere. So filling, proactively filling up data voids is really critical for the smooth functioning of an information ecosystem. And I think 2022 so far has shown mm -hmm. us that that's mm -hmm. radical, a radical improvement here. So I thank you. And I'm, so I'm hearing that the uh, there were more reliable sources of information out there. People, institutions were more responsive um, and quick to refute inaccurate claims. Um, but what what is the incentive then <clears throat> for certain elected officials to continue to propagate misinformation? Um, is it seen exclusively as a political strategy? Is it seen as a way to sort of push back on a narrative that they fundamentally disagree with, that the mainstream media is pursuing? You know, what what in your understanding is the motivation of certain candidates to buy in to the misinformation when they may in fact know that what they're saying is not accurate? Yeah. Well, you know, for individual candidates, it if you know, pushing people to distrust other sources of information and only trust you, um, that could be very tempting for a candidate, right? Like it, none right. of us like to answer uncomfortable questions from the press. We would all love to not have to be accountable to independent actors, to an independent media. So it's understandable that individual candidates um, may have an incentive to win your trust and tell you to distrust everyone else. Individual candidates may want to have these closed, to pull people out of the sort of mainstream information or, or to simply cause trust decay more broadly. Um, to to benefit from across the board from a decay in trust in public institutions. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. any, you know, um, candidates, politicians and others who care about democracy understand that you cannot just destroy trust and, and somehow benefit from that personally and not also be impacted by the broader implications of that. Societies need trust and need trust in trustworthy public institutions in order to function. Um, so the, and, and here's an example of that. There, there's research that shows that, for instance, um, 
when municipalities lose independent newspapers, the cost of bond issues for those municipalities goes up. So you have to pay more to borrow money if you're in a municipality that happens not to have a newspaper. That's not because anyone is tracking those numbers, but on balance, um, I, municipal, bond, municipalities that have strong local newspapers are held accountable and are much less likely to you know, default on bonds to have, you know, um, massive scandals in which money is ill spent, and then the municipality ends up bankrupt, and so on. So even though any individual, you know, borough council member might not want to have a pesky newspaper bugging them, uh, town councils in general really benefit from having a strong local newspaper right. system. And that's true for states as well. So the the overall interests of our political system and political actors within it are really benefited from having a trustworthy independent information structure there, which includes right. first and foremost, a really important place for the press, uh, right. for the you know newspaper, uh, radio, TV and all. Um, let, <clears throat> let me ask you about the role that businesses can play in uh, offering reliable, trustworthy information. And we certainly know that, you know, businesses are generally well-respected, seen as credible authorities on uh, facts about whether it was COVID or about education policy. And one of the areas, um, Laura, that Business for America is working on is focused on civics education. And you know our our central premise is that a more civically literate public, starting with school age kids, you know, makes for more engaged citizens who become less susceptible to mis and disinformation and conspiracy theories. So if you think about what we've just learned from 2022, and you think about the role that businesses can play um, in pushing back on false narratives about how elections work, any recommendations that you could offer us? Sure. Well, I think businesses are, should be thinking along a two sort of two tracks here. One is that absolutely businesses tend to be trusted sources of information and so and and trusted as nonpartisan sources of information. And so to the extent that they can, you know, be um, conduits for to sort of uh, reestablish the validity of, a, you know, health information, public health information, um, and trust in our elections, you know, all to the good. And to, to sort of put the, the clear stamp of nonpartisan approval on, on issues like, you know, trust in trustworthy elections. But the other piece of it is that business, the interests of businesses, just like the interests of local politicians, are really served by having a trustworthy independent information system, mm -hmm. right? Which doesn't, which doesn't necessarily run through their own channels and which occasionally probably, you know, occasionally will be uncomfortable for them. Someone maybe, you know, some local newspaper reporter may ask uncomfortable questions mm -hmm. of you, a business person, but it's still in your interest for that local, independent local media to be there. And it's really in your interest for them to be independent of you, right? Mm -hmm. There might be tempting to think, oh, the more that we can influence what gets said in the press, the better. That's not really, your interests are really served by having that trustworthy nonpartisan and um uh, independent flow of information you can businesses probably should begin think because in a digital age you can't take a strong information ecosystem for granted right it needs to be especially uh at, after the decline of um uh local newspapers that we've seen across pennsylvania and elsewhere and especially in an era in which trust in, for instance higher education is sometimes uh treated as a partisan issue you can't take for granted a solid information ecosystem. So businesses should think of this as they think about like water supply. If you're going to in, if you're going to go invest somewhere, you know that there needs to be a, a reliable water supply. You don't want to be single handedly responsible for panning out like plastic jugs of water in the factory. You want to be able to tap into an existing infrastructure of reliable, safe, clean water so that you don't have to think about it. Well, the same okay. is really true of information ecosystems. So thinking about what does the supply of local trustworthy information look like in this place and how can we just help that supply function better? We don't want to be part of that system. We just want the system to function better. Okay, great. Good. Thank you for that advice. <clears throat> okay, Let, let's turn to uh, Azaz Gill, who is the Pennsylvania Policy Director for Business for America. And Azaz, um, you know, part of your job in Pennsylvania is to uh, shepherd these businesses that Laura's just been talking about to engage in different initiatives. So maybe if you could just start by just giving folks uh, an understanding of what um, Business for America is doing in Pennsylvania, the types of campaigns, the types of programs 
um, that we're working on that companies can participate in if they choose. Sure. Well, first, I want to thank everyone for joining us on this panel today. Thank you for all the people in the who have been interacting in the chat. And I want to thank our panelists as well. You guys have all been brilliant. So, uh, so Business for America in Pennsylvania, we are we work with businesses that are small. We work with large corporations, and our our goal is to bring your attention to these issues that we've been talking about about how having fair districts in Pennsylvania allows a more reasonable legislature, which is focused on, on priorities, which, which benefit businesses. Uh, we are working with, uh, with other, we're working with businesses throughout the, the state to you know, bring attention to issues like pre-canvassing. So one of the things I wanted to talk about in, in this panel today was what we're gonna be doing over the, over the next year. And with the legislature, which is right now, as of right now anyway, we're looking at about 100, I think it's 100 Republicans and 101 Democrats in the legislature. And we might be able to get them to work on issues which are much more, uh, which are much more in tune with what the people of Pennsylvania want. So one of those issues is pre-canvassing. For those of you who don't know, Pennsylvania right now, when it comes to counting mail-in ballots, county boards of elections are only allowed to count mail-in ballots starting at 7 a.m. in the morning. A lot of times when people get frustrated, hey, why don't we have results on election night? It's because counties weren't able to tabulate, start tabulating those mail-in ballots. So starting next year, we uh, Business for America wants to work with the legislature on develop and bring a biz, large coalition of businesses in with us to, to bring to Harrisburg's attention, like, hey, this is an important issue. We need to start having pre-canvassing. And the, it seems like the, the one of the possible contenders for speaker, Joanna McClinton, uh, has already inter introduced a bill on this last year where she, you know, she brought in a whole bunch of county board of election officials throughout the state, and they wanted to increase the the date that they could start counting mail-in ballots to about 21 days before the uh, before the before election day. This would be great because we could avoid uh, we could avoid scenarios where where bad faith actors claim that hey, I had a lead of of such and such, and due to Due to these ballot mail-in ballots coming in, the, this lead, suspiciously coming in in data batches or whatever, my lead has dwindled. So it's it's issues like that that Business for America wants to to focus on, not just pre-canvassing. You know, we we have other issues that we're looking at as well, like uniform policies throughout the state. So for example, uh, in so Philadelphia, Allegheny counties were allowed for what's called ballot curing, which if you misstated a ballot. Uh, you could kind of, they released the the names of the voters who had missed uh, information on it, and they could come in to their local county board of elections, and they could fill out, uh, f uh, correct their mistake. It's called ballot curing. But other other counties in the state didn't allow for that. So, for example, like Erie, uh, I believe Lancaster County didn't allow for that. Northumberland, Somerset, and York counties had no procedures. You could see how this would create like confusion throughout the state, though. Because if one county, your, your neighboring county is allowing you to go in and carry your ballot, but your county isn't allowing you to do that, it creates an inherent distrust in the system. So these are the kinds of issues we want to work on. Like We want to have a uniform system where all, all counties throughout the state have a system that everyone agrees upon. Okay. Uh, Azos, thanks. Let, let me ask you. So, when you when you think further about the impact that these rules have on the state's economic competitiveness, you know, companies uh, can decide to operate in Maryland or in Pennsylvania or in Delaware. You know, they they can move if they find that the political environment is not conducive to getting business done in an efficient way. So, what's the business case for encouraging greater functionality in our political system. You know, Carol mentioned a few uh, items about changing the rules, but when you think about economic competitiveness and political dysfunction, what what uh, what comes to mind and you know what why is this a business concern? So let me start off by first saying that I've always been of the opinion that Pennsylvania should be like an extremely attractive destination for businesses. We have an exodus of businesses moving out of states like California, Illinois, New York. Why aren't they coming to Pennsylvania? Look, we have a very good, we, we have a state 
where which is just got ranked by Forbes as the fourth best state in the in the nation to start a business at. We have an estate income tax rate of about 3.07%, which compared to New York's 10.09 is, is, is negligible. So why aren't we becoming more for premier destination for, for businesses to come here? It's because some of the, the rhetoric we've had for, heard from the legislature. When you have really talented and educated workforces, you want to move them to a state which accommodates their needs. And some of the rhetoric we heard coming out of, uh, out of the legislature didn't, didn't make it seem like Pennsylvania was an attractive destination for, even though it very much is because of the existing structure we have, because we are so, we are on the East Coast and the cost of living in Pennsylvania is much lower in, than it is in New York or Massachusetts or places like that. But I will say after the results of this election, I am cautiously optimistic that we will have a legislature that will be good. I'm cautiously optimistic about the political environment for businesses in Pennsylvania during the upcoming 2023 to 2024 legislative session. When with a much closer makeup in the state house right now, like I said before, it's a, as of right now, I think it's 101 Democrats, 100 Republicans. Mm -hmm. You know, you're gonna have, you're gonna have state legislatures who are much more concerned about keeping their seats when uh, the sad reality of of the sad reality of elected officials is. The first time, the first day they get into office, their mind immediately turns to, all right, now how do I get reelected? And if that's their motivation, which a lot of times it is, they want to focus on issues that are going to be important to their constituents. So they want to, they should be work there over the next year. They they should be working on issues like workforce development, making us uh, making Pennsylvania a strong econo economy, right? You can tout those things when you go back to your district and you do a town hall, you can go up there and be like, this is what I worked on in Harrisburg. This is what I brought to our district. Instead of, you know, relitigating the 2020 election once more or, or you know, making accusations against a, a mail-in ballot voting system, which, is, uh, which was used by more than 1.1 million Pennsylvanians in, the, in just this previous election. It's things like that which make me cautiously optimistic about the upcoming, uh, about the upcoming environment for business in this legislature in Pennsylvania. Okay. So how can companies who are interested in these issues get involved in Business for America's work? Is there, well, yeah, so. Was, well, you, you kind of took my that. I was gonna say, please contact Business for America and we will definitely uh, set you up with that. But yeah, but honestly, we're like, we're, we're happy to work with small businesses. We're happy to work with large companies as we've been doing our, already to get you involved with some of these, uh, get you up to date, up to speed on some of these issues and get you more involved in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And do you think that the state legislature, uh, legislators will be more receptive, you know, this coming legislative season um, because of the results? Do you think there's more motivation for them to collaborate? Yes. I, I think when, when you have a state, I mean, Carol brought this up earlier when she was speaking, I think Dan alluded to it as well. Mm -hmm. like, when they brought up these issues, like about how a closer legislature, and if you're, if you do want, like I think both Republicans and Democrats realize that you need to win over independents and moderates to, in order to, with fair districts, that's that's who they need to hold on to. Uh, for I believe in this case, for Republicans to regain back the House and for Democrats to hold on to it in the future, which requires them to have bipartisan solutions and, and pass legislation which appeals to both sides of the aisle. We will get away, it seems like as of right now, we will get away from more la radical legislation and go towards more kitchen table issues or economic issues, especially with a forthcoming, uh, I, I hate to say this, but it, it seemed like a forthcoming recession over the next year or so. Right. Hope, hopefully you're wrong on that. Um, I, I hope so too. Every day I wake up for the, for the, right. sake, of my, uh, for the sake of my stock uh, investments. I, I hope I'm very wrong. <laughs> Right. Good. Good. Uh, Azos, thanks. Um, so let's let's just do a quick lightning round. I'm going to want to ask each of the panelists one final question here in our, our final five minutes. Um, so, Dan, when you think of the impact that the Philadelphia Inquirer had on providing people with a solid understanding of this is how the election system works, um, is that something that the paper is going to carry on and maybe help other newspapers follow through with to, you know, to provide timely, accurate, insightful information about elections? Yeah, I think that this is something that we're going to continue with uh, for the foreseeable future. 
Um, you know, John Lai, he's our election integrity editor. Um, he loves that role. Uh, he, he really enjoys it. Um, we, we've, like you said, we've done a good, really great, great job of getting the information out to people. And we've created a really great network of sources and information to use on the topic. Um, I definitely think it, it's hard. Newspapers are seeing huge cuts across the country, um, especially the ones that aren't fortunate enough to be owned by a nonprofit foundation like the Enquirer. Um, you know, if you're owned by some big, uh, you know, multinational like Gannett, they're they're really, you know, gutting some newspapers. But if you're a newspaper that does have the resources, you can definitely reach out to the Enquirer and John and everybody else on his team, and mm -hmm. they would be happy to to help any newspaper. Uh, we, we've, we've worked with other newspapers uh, to help with uh, you know, crime coverage. Uh, that's another area where we're trying to really evolve to meet what the 21st century needs on that, on that beat. Um, and on elections, I, we would, you know, I'm sure that the team would be glad to help any paper. Okay, good, thank you, that's good to know. Um, Carol, I know that uh, Fair Districts PA is having a conference in the next few weeks, so, why don't you tell us briefly about that, should folks wish to attend? Sure, we're having a conference on December 3rd. It will be our first in-person conference in three years. So we're looking forward to getting our team back together, um, but also looking forward to having folks from other organizations and um, people who are concerned about democracy and how it works and also interested in understanding better how the legislative process works. The more we learn, the more concerned we are. We have volunteers um, who are doing a lot of research um, trying to compare Pennsylvania's legislature to other states, trying to understand where bills get stuck, trying to understand what kinds of rules would allow bills to move more quickly, and how to make it a more functional, um, effective, efficient um, state legislative process. So we'll be talking about that, sharing some of what we've learned, and, and offering ways for people to engage um, to help our state legislature be more functional, but also to help our our entire Commonwealth thrive. So uh, December 3rd in Harrisburg, um, one of our folks will stick a link um, if you want to register or I'll do that. We'll stick it in the in the um, in the chat before we end. Great. Good. Thank you, Carol. Um, Laura, um, complicated question, but relatively short answer, please. When you think again about the role that business can play in being a reliable source about how you know, what's involved in being a citizen in this country, the value of our democracy, how elections work, you know, what's the one thing that you want to leave this audience with? Um, if they're running a business, what can they be doing? Yeah, I think taking that actively pro small d democracy stance is really critical. It's in insisting that being that being in support of broad public participation in active democracy is not a partisan question. So mm -hmm. wanting to make sure that every eligible voter gets registered and votes, that's, that shouldn't be a partisan question. That should, be, that should be a core of what unites us as Americans. And I think businesses of large and small have a great trusted platform to make that case and, and, and uh, to support others who are making that case as well. Okay, great. Laura, thank you. So we're we're almost at the top of the hour. So I wanted to thank everybody. Uh, I want you to uh, encourage everyone to you know uh, follow up with with Azaz. Uh, his email is listed here: a i z a z at bfa .us. We'd be happy to chat with you all. Think about how we can work together on some of these really important issues as we go into the new year. So thank you all. Really appreciate all the speakers and the insights and look forward to working with um, everybody in the coming, coming weeks and months. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.